Welcome to the U.S. Resiliency Council's webinar on the case for resilient design, building rating systems. What is resilience? The news media, social scientists, economists, engineers, all have definitions of what makes a resilient community. Most of those definitions include measures of how quickly a community, a company, or a family even, recovers from an adverse event. But what does resilience really mean? One way to measure resilience is the functionality of a system over time. That system can be a, a city, a company, or a family that when impacted by an adverse event suffers a loss in functionality that it has to recover from. How deep that loss is and how quickly the system recovers is a measure of its resilience. A more resilient community or system will suffer less loss and recover more quickly than a less resilient system. And the gap between those two can be measured in terms of costs, like the amount of resources it takes to respond to the event, the loss in property and social structure, and the economy of that system. Consider the two cities of Nashville and New Orleans. From 2002 until 2005, both were on an upward economic trajectory. But at the end of 2005, when Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans, that city suffered an enormous initial shock, losing up to $80 billion in property damage and economic loss. But it didn't end there. New Orleans was not a resilient community, and even seven years later struggled to regain the lost productivity it had before Hurricane Katrina struck. Where Nashville, if you think of that more as a proxy for what New Orleans might have been like had the hurricane not struck the city, or if it had been more resilient, continued on an upward path. So over the intervening seven years after Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans lost about another hundred plus billion dollars in economic output because it wasn't able to recover and wasn't resilient. There are a lot of things that make a community resilient. It's social structure, it's health care, it's schools, it's economy, emergency response, the financial capacity of the community. These things typically have at least one thing in common, and that is the performance of their building infrastructure. Buildings are not the only measure of a community's resilience, but clearly the performance of a city's building stock has an enormous impact on the ability of the city to recover and thrive after an event. It might be interesting to understand a common misconception about how building codes are developed in the United States. We generally consider three dimensions of performance of a building in a natural disaster, safety, damage or repair cost, and recovery time, the time it takes for the building to be back in operation. The building codes typically look only at the safety dimension. Their focus is on preserving the lives of the people and the occupants inside the building, allowing them to exit safely and not resulting in building collapse. But building codes don't always take into account these other important dimensions of damage and recovery. Resilience-based design is another concept that can be used to consider the importance of these other dimensions. Because whether it's a community or a business, a school, a hospital, understanding the full performance of a building in, with respect to these three dimensions is critical in improving resilience. Does this matter? Well, let me give you an example of Christchurch, New Zealand. The city of Christchurch, New Zealand had a population of about 400,000. But in 2010 and 2011, was subjected to two very large earthquakes within the space of a few months. The good news is among the thousands of buildings in Christchurch, only two collapsed, and those that were killed in the earthquake were primarily in those buildings. Now, from the perspective of a building code, when you have thousands of buildings subject to two very large earthquakes, to only have two collapse would be considered a success. However, the economic losses in Christchurch were significant, over $25 billion in damage, and more importantly, over 70% of the buildings in the downtown business district had to be demolished because they were so extensively damaged. So did the performance of these buildings meet the expectations? Well, it depends who you ask. From a code perspective, yes, only two buildings collapsed. But when you talk to the people that lived and worked in Christchurch and had to abandon their homes and businesses, clearly that wasn't the case. Well, let's look at another example closer to home, New York and New Jersey in 2012. Superstorm Sandy traveled up the East Coast, killed over 200 people in seven countries, 
damaged nearly 400,000 buildings and caused economic losses in the United States in excess of $70 billion. A real interesting statistic is that over 10 million cubic yards of debris were generated as buildings were damaged or destroyed. Now, ironically, in New Jersey and New York area, there were more LEED certified buildings than anywhere else in the country. And those buildings were built primarily to have a low impact on the environment. But they weren't built for the environment to have a low impact on them. And that is the difference between sustainability and resilience. Sustainability is a concept that we all understand has grown into uh, a major part of building design in the United States over the past 20 years. But it's different than resilience. And yet the two are very compatible. When we think of sustainability, we think of often of reducing energy use and reducing the amount of materials that are used and the impact that the, the mining of those materials has on, on the environment and contributing less to greenhouse gases and global warming. And those are all obviously noble pursuits. But beyond that, resilience looks at what happens after an adverse event and focuses on preservation of lives, of building assets themselves, of uh, business recovery, uh, of generating less debris and waste, making the buildings last longer so that fewer materials have to be used to replace them. Ultimately, resilient communities are stronger and last longer and ultimately are more sustainable. So sustainability and resilience are two important concepts that really go hand in hand and the architectural and engineering community should look at them as such when considering the design of buildings. To that end, structural engineers have improved their design capability beyond looking only at code level life safety design. Engineers today can consider performance based design for different classes and different types of buildings. And that performance based design can look not only at life safety, but also the operability, the functionality, the occupancy of a building after a major disaster. And so depending on the type of building, whether it's a hospital or school or a data center or an apartment complex, engineers now have the tools to design buildings to a specific level of performance. And so how does that look in practice? Well, you take a building and you can measure its performance along the dimensions of safety, damage, and recovery. And different buildings designed to different levels of performance, or the same building designed to different levels of performance, will have different responses to an adverse event. Over the past 20 years, the engineering community, with the assistance of the architectural community, the federal and state government, have developed robust and powerful tools to measure the performance of buildings in natural disasters. This can be used not only to evaluate existing buildings, but to promote performance-based design in buildings that are now being constructed or will be built in the future. Here's an example. Well, let's take a look at the San Bernardino Courthouse. This state facility was just completed in 2014. 300 million dollar state court facility and the original design had intended to be a fixed base steel structure where the steel frame was went down to the ground was attached directly to the foundation the structural engineer of record however wanted to look at using a base isolation system and said and that the performance of that building if base isolated would be so much better in the long term over the 50 or 100 year life cycle of the building that it would make sense from an economic perspective to invest in base isolation. And from this graph, you can just see just that. Earthquakes of different sizes that might affect the building over the next 50 or 100 years have vastly different outcomes in terms of performance, depending on whether the building was base isolated or conventionally constructed of a steel frame bolted to the ground. And that difference translates directly into measurable, quantifiable metrics, like reduced property costs, property losses, reduced recovery time, and ultimately a positive and measurable return on investment in the base isolation technology. We use rating systems every day for choosing colleges, or restaurants, hotels, or cars. Rating systems are a way the consumer gathers enough information to make a rational decision about how to invest their resources. These rating systems are often simple to understand and communicate to the public, but they also overlay a complex evaluation done by a third party to judge the performance of these goods or services. So, in a similar way, a rating system for buildings 
would evaluate what the expected performance is using performance-based design and evaluation methodologies that currently exist to establish metrics that can communicate performance to building stakeholders. So coming back to this graphic of community resilience and the importance of building performance, the importance of understanding the performance of buildings through rating systems like those developed by the U.S. Resiliency Council can be very important as a community or a business looks over the long term to improve their overall resilience. The U.S. Resiliency Council is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It was founded back in 2011. Our vision is a world in which building performance in natural hazards is understood and better communicated to those stakeholders who will live, work, invest, and insure buildings. Our mission is to establish and implement rating systems that describe the performance of buildings during earthquakes and other natural disasters so that consumers and stakeholders can make informed decisions about the buildings in which they live and work. A USRC rating considers the performance of the building structure and also, as importantly, the non-structural components of a building, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems, and the architectural components that can contribute a significant percentage of the overall loss in a building after a damaging event. The USRC rates each building across the dimensions of safety, damage, and recovery time, and awards a number of stars in each dimension based on the expected performance of the building. This star rating system is a simple to understand metric for the public, but underlying the stars is a detailed evaluation performed using current state-of-the-art methodologies. Key to the success of any rating system is that it provide credibility, consistency, and value to its users. The USRC achieves its credibility through having had more than 50 structural engineering firms, as well as all major professional earthquake engineering research organizations involved in the development of the USRC rating system. The USRC certifies engineers who have the experience and the expertise necessary to evaluate buildings for the hazard that they're being considered for. And the USRC coordinates a technical review of each evaluation that's done to ensure that it conforms to the USRC standards. The USRC rating system also brings significant stakeholder value by communicating performance across the three dimensions of safety, damage, and recovery, doing so in a way that can add market value to the buildings and allow stakeholders to make better informed decisions about purchasing or lending or improving or leasing structures uh, in their community. And the USRC rating system delivers consistency through using a standardized methodology that is fair and that is objective. The USRC awards placards, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum for buildings that achieve certain thresholds and levels of performance across all three dimensions so that again the public and building stakeholders can readily understand the performance of the buildings in which they live and work. So for a community that rates its buildings under the USRC rating system it will better understand how the community and its infrastructure is likely to respond to a damaging event. Which buildings in its inventory are likely to be the most heavily damaged? Which ones have the greatest functional need to make the city more resilient? And how are they going to perform? As cities adopt ordinances to retrofit existing buildings or to design new buildings to higher levels of performance, the USRC rating system can be used as a way to gather information and measure the overall progress of a city or a company in long-term resilience strategy. The USRC rating system is currently being used by public and private building owners to establish design guidelines for the performance of new buildings. The question often comes up, well how much more does it cost to design a building and build a building using uh, the USRC rating system to achieve a higher rating? Well, as it turns out, that extra cost is typically very small. On average, to achieve a gold or a platinum USRC rating only increases the cost of the building by about 1 to 10 percent. The San Bernardino Courthouse project that I mentioned earlier, the increase in cost was only about 1 percent of the overall building cost to go to the base isolation system. So what does that mean for the architecture and engineering community, the, the advent of building rating systems like the U.S. Resiliency Council? 
the AE community is evolving from code-based design that it had been doing for decades in the past, where architects and engineers would follow the code, the prescriptive requirements, focusing primarily on first cost of the building, the construction cost, and nothing beyond the point at which the building was commissioned. With the advent of performance-based design, engineers and architects are able to describe the performance of the building in terms of these dimensions of safety, damage, and recovery, and start to think about the future of the building as well and its performance in natural disasters. <clears throat> Resilience-based design is the next evolution of the AE profession, where we look not only at the building itself, but how the performance of that building integrates into the resilience of the overall community. This makes the engineer and architectural communities more valuable to building owners, to business owners, and to communities as they're able to provide design advice relating to the overall resilience of those communities and businesses and not simply on the one building at hand. Ultimately, our vision is that the U.S. Resiliency Council will partner with organizations that focus on, res on sustainability, like the U.S. Green Buildings Council, to develop a more holistic picture of what sustainability and resilience really mean in the context of the built environment, so that concepts of having a lower impact on the environment and of the environment having a lower impact on the building are both incorporated each time as a, a building is designed and constructed. Ultimately, cities, communities, even companies can develop resilience plans for their portfolio of structures so that after a major event buildings will perform in a manner so that the entire community can get back into operation sooner and restore uh, its functionality and its economic output. That brings us back to the Hurricane uh, Katrina example and if New Orleans had been built around the concept of resilience both its social structures and also, of course, its, its building infrastructure, the amount of loss that it would suffer would have been reduced and its recovery time and its recovery costs uh, would have dropped as well. The USRC is proud to have among its members over 70 structural engineers, architects, professional organizations, all committed to the concept of improving and promoting resilience across the country. We'd love to have you as a member of the U.S. Resiliency Council. So you can help us grow and sustain ourselves as we promote the concept of resilience, develop and implement building rating systems across the country, not only for earthquakes, but for other hazards like flood and hurricane, and so that you can actually help us develop those standards as well and those rating systems so that they will be meaningful and valuable to the stakeholder community. If you'd like more information on the U.S. Resiliency Council, please check out our website at usrc.org or email us to find out how you can get involved and to see what the USRC is currently doing and where we plan to go in the future. Thank you for attending this webinar, and we look forward to hearing from you.